Which regiment were you in? Uh, I was in a variety of regiments, but I was in the Royal Engineers. Mm. Um, when I served in uh, Afghanistan back in 2006, I was part of 3-9 Engineers. Mm. What was it like being in Afghanistan? Well, we went into what was Camp Bastion, um, which was a completely new area. Um, it was lawless down there. The Americans hardly went down there. Mm. And I was actually the advance party that went in with the Royal Marines to um, take the, hold the position uh, until the rest of the squadron followed. As an engineer, you would have been there to build the roads, to build the uh, defences... Well, people sometimes think that, but we're soldiers just as much as anything else. No, I know, I know, but that you would be down there right at the front, yeah. uh, actually building the infrastructure to, to, to help the guys coming after you. But yeah, obviously you're soldiers, yeah. Well, it was the biggest military undertaking since mm. World War II. I mean, Camp Bastion, I've not been there. Uh, I have friends who've been there, and they say it was the most... I mean, they couldn't believe it. It was... Enormous. The size of Guildford in the end, James, by the time we left six months later. Surrounded by a wall. Uh, and I built most of that wall. <laughs> On your own, Gary. I like to Think tell you... the kids so. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I noticed you've got a um, some sort of injury. Yes. What was that? Um, I don't like to go into my, um, my military past too mm -hmm. much, but I was medically discharged from the army with severe neck and spinal injuries mm -hmm. and undiagnosed mental health problems. OK. Um, when you first went to theatre, um, I'm talking about war, obviously, for people, uh, was it what you expected with, after all your training or not? Um, yes, it, yes, it was, to be honest. And um, I went there with the opinion that I went to have hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. I didn't go there to take life. I actually went there to save life. And when you actually see the people and how downtrodden they are, and they've got no services, mm. no electric, no schools, mm. n you know, no freedom, that's what made me, um, uh, made me feel like I was there for the right reasons. Were you prepared to kill somebody? Of course. Because that is a very... Which quite often, with some of the new adverts of recruitment... Uh, they make it look as if it's all lovely and marvellous and you'll see the world and everything else. But nobody asks the one question that everybody should ask, someone who's going into the forces to fight. I spent most of my time, to be honest, looking after the young ones. Yep. What I didn't want to do it was someone that was in my section to have to go home and tell their mum mm. that they weren't coming home. So but that most is one of, of my the problems attention. that sometimes will happen, of course. Well... You know, there's a lot of justifications. Should we be there? Should we? Ha mm. Should we? It doesn't matter to me. But a soldier shouldn't have those thoughts. Uh, if I had hesitated, I could have got killed. Mm. I was there to do a job. So were my comrades, and I was there to keep ourselves mm. alive. Because you were injured, and because you came back, and because you got mental health problems, which you still have, which you um, still I'm still dealing with things. I don't think I'm ever going to be free from mental health. I struggle with night terrors every mm. night of my life. I do weird reenactments um, occasionally, which, you know, scares the family slightly. Mm. Um, what do you mean, like, reenactments? Uh, one thing my wife says I do is look for a rifle um, when I'm not... I, she says I'm awake, mm. but yeah. she can stand right in front of my face and my eyes don't even flinch. Yeah. Um, and she finds me doing some quite strange things. Mm. Do you ever talk about what it was like there with your family? Um, yes, I do. Mm. Yes, I do. And I talk about my career a lot because um, I think it's important, especially to educate the youngsters that are actually thinking about joining yeah. because they've got to be prepared for what's coming their mm. way. Right, which is what I was saying, and, and you need to understand that, that um, you may have to take a human life, you may see your best friend... Gosh. Um, the, well, there are things I don't even want to talk to you about that you may well see. Mm -hmm. uh, you tried to kill yourself a couple of times. Yeah. Why? Um, I got MD'd out of the army. I wasn't rehoused. Medically discharged. Yeah, medically discharged mm -hmm. out of the army. I wasn't rehoused in where I'm from, like I was promised. I wasn't... I didn't get um, uh, priority treatment. In fact, let's just talk about what happened. You were in hospital... Uh, they mended your injuries, but they didn't mend your brain, really. 
And I mean, your injuries are going to be with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you had a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they they said it was time for you to leave the hospital. What happened? Back in 2015, um, the, the NHS wasn't on par with what's going on, you know. And the, let's be honest, they closed the war hospitals in the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. but they did not fund or train the NHS to deal with us. Mm -hmm. So now 20, 30 years later, you've got a massive tsunami of mental health, not just post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress, but all the others mm -hmm. entwined. When I went to the hospital, they felt they couldn't treat me, and the easiest thing was to get rid of me. Um, but sadly, they uh, missed a serious infection in my legs, mm -hmm. and I was left at a bus stop in my pyjamas sobbing. And it wasn't a great day, and because I felt like I'd been abandoned by the army, and now I'm abandoned <laughs> by society. Tell me about the army abandoning you, Gary, um, because... It, when we were at the height of the, the problems in Afghanistan and every day, every week, we were seeing body bags coming back and I never ever saw any flags on the Ministry of Defence brought down to half-mast and I think they should have done. Yeah, so do I. I, I, I don't think, and, and to be fair, you try and get out of the army... You try and find out how many people have been injured and how bad their injuries are. They really don't want to tell you because the fatalities are one thing. The injuries that our guys suffered in these recent troubles is appalling, and well, the amount of them. We've got a serious influx of veteran suicides. There was nine, uh, nearly 90 families came forward on Facebook last year, and there were many that didn't and mm. didn't want to be put on the list. We're already at 40 this year. You've got a family, Gary. Why did you want to take your own life? Um, my post-traumatic stress and mental health, um, all I could focus on was the dark, negative things. I was having flashbacks of dark, dark things. And sadly, because I'd been to try and get so much help and got turned away, I felt like a burden. And however it's difficult it is to say... It was the greatest sign of love I could have showed my family at the time was mm. to end them of me mm. because I felt there was no future for me. There was no hope. And hope's a funny thing. And if you've got no hope in life, then life gets uh, pointless and yet dangerous. One of the hardest things I ever had to do was come home after my suicides and go and tell my teenage children why I didn't want to be their father anymore. But you've got a hope now, yeah? You don't, yeah? Yes, I'm lucky. I've got a house, I've got a wife, I've got two kids. We're not rich, but, but we're getting by. There's many veterans out there now that have got nothing. Yeah. They haven't got a home. There's thousands of us homeless, sleeping on sofas on the streets. Uh, there's thousands of us waiting mm -hmm. to get treatment. Take me, take me back to why you feel that the army abandoned you? What do you think that they did that they shouldn't have done? The problem is, especially with the army, not so much with the other ones, uh, with the Navy and the Air Force, you are a soldier. And if you have got mental health problems, you cannot pick up that rifle. Mm. You can't pick up that rifle, you're no good to them. But instead of helping me, they abandoned me and they destroyed me. How did they destroy you? It was just, I gave my life. I gave 10 years to my country. I bled green. I put the army before my family and my kids again and again and again. And the moment I was too injured for them, it is literally like your drops like a hot potato. And they almost, back then, encouraged others to stay away in case it caught. When you say encourage others to stay away, how do you mean? Well, my friends. Yeah. Who you were know, still serving in the army. Yeah, well, they I didn't was... Want, not... they, they didn't want them to see what could happen to them yes. in a similar situation. And it's the way you're treated, mm. you know. And then I come out onto civilian street and I go to mental health after mental health after mental health and I get turned away every time saying, we are not trained or funded to deal with you. In the end, I was giving up. You see, I don't understand. We're in a situation like this. We're in the 21st century. 
I have a member of my family who has uh, post-traumatic stress, not from being in the forces, from something because it can happen to a lot of people. And they go in very dark places at very dark times and feel that they're not really... They're just a, a hindrance and a burden to everybody. And we all get like that. We all get down. But to be prepared to actually go and do something about it... And you can be great one minute. This is the other problem. You can be like you are now, but you could go out of here, and you know this as well as I do, so I'm not. You could go out of here, and th and, and these thoughts come back into your mind. Yeah, simple and things can trigger you off, James. Absolutely. absolutely. You could go down the escalator here, and you could say, right, I'm not having any more of it. We have not worked out a way yet to help. And to, We think, oh, it's all in your mind. We think, oh, this is, you know, it isn't. It's a damage in your brain. And it means that... that I don't know, surely doctors are training on this. Surely we're training people to do this. I well, can't understand, sorry, that you were dumped out of a hospital at a bus stop in your pyjamas. Yeah. I mean, I'm almost tempted to say to you, Gary, I don't believe you. Yeah, it happens, unfortunately. And I'm not dragging up the past, you know. When I thought about doing this story and coming on here today... Um, I made that I made the decision that unless we can be honest about the things that have gone wrong and the things that haven't worked properly, we're never going to learn and move forward. I'm now working very closely with NHS England um, on a bit on a veteran board, and um, to make sure things like this uh, stop happening. And we're also training the NHS staff uh, to deal with us and to spot us in a much better way. Uh, and and that is the only way forward. You know, your wife should get a medal, really, because yeah. a lot of wives can't cope, particularly if you've got children, because you suffer where you are. It can be dangerous for your children and for your wife. Yeah. Because I'm not. It's not your fault, but you know, if you have been in a situation like you have, and it gets back in your brain, who knows what you're able to do. I've got an incredibly strong woman that's known me since I was 18. We've mm. been together for nearly 22 years now. She saw the man before, she saw the man during, and she saw what I turned into after mm. Afghanistan. Mm. And she saw me turn into a recluse, and my confidence was lost, and my self-respect. Do you think, I mean, presumably you are now getting help, hopefully. Yes, and, I am. And a lot, of, a lot of what helps, and lots of people do not understand this, is talking about it. Yeah. And talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. Um, but lots of people in your position don't want to do that. Well, that's why we came up with the idea of the, of the retreat, to be honest, James, mm. because veterans helping veterans are, is the best way forward. Mm. I've been to organisations and they wheel out a nice fresh CV straight from a university. They have no uh, military in their family. They've got no idea. And it's PowerPoint to death, and they look oh. as bored as we do. Mm -hmm. And what we've tried to do is we've, we're looking at prevention, not cure. We're going to get we're giving them a space, safe space to come, but the mental health professionals at hand. We're not telling them you must talk at eleven o'clock and then go go back mm -hmm. to your room. Yeah. We're having the people ready at hand, so if they decide to talk, mm -hmm. then the people are there, and that's what's really working. Do you think you were trained well enough to go into an area like Afghanistan? Yes, I do. What do you think it was when you were there that actually tipped you over? It's a stressful, stressful environment, mm. you know. You see things, you do things, there's a lot of tension, a lot of stress. Uh, we were travelling around in soft, soft skin trucks in the middle of Afghanistan, being told we're going to get blown up every day. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, telling 22... I thought they'd stop that. I they have that. stopped it, but they, that was an example of where you're not looked after, isn't it? Well, that was at the beginning. We were mm -hmm. the first ones in. And we, we were very unprepared. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mental health is not a dirty word. Mm -hmm. And only in the last two years has the armed forces really started to take mental health seriously. And if I could have gone to them earlier and said, I'm struggling, hmm. without the fear... Did you know you were struggling when you were in Afghanistan? Yes. Yes, did. I you, did. Did, were you able to say to your commanding officer? My, my, my troop and my friends were very supportive, uh, but they noticed a change in me. Hmm. 
Um, and whether it was the tablets we took, whether it was the places we went... Explain the tablets that you took. Uh, there's some questions about some of the pills that they'd be making us take, larium and stuff like that. Why yeah. do they make you take those? Um, against malaria, oh. naps oh. and uh, stuff uh, against chemical nerve agents. Mm. And uh, there's a big thing saying that these pills have actually yeah, yeah. caused us mm. to have mental health problems. Yeah. You know, I'm no scientist and I'm not here to discuss that and it's well above my prey grade, but the MOD seriously needs to slow mm. down and start looking at all the mm. alternatives. And as soon as you felt that you were changing or people around you saw you were changing, mm. um, you then, you not only become a danger to yourself, but you become a danger to the others. Yeah. Do they, did they then move you out? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. Out the back gate. Mm. I didn't even get de-kitted. They took my helmet and my body armour off me and they shooed me out the back door. And they thought the problem went away to die. When they shooed you out the back door, where did you go? Um, we had to find our own housing and we had... But they took you back, they sent you back to Britain? Well, to your... no, what I mean was when I was at my base, right. they send you home, mm. they tell you not to come in, mm. they encourage your friends not to visit you because it catches mental health, apparently. It did then, anyway. Mm. Um, and then you feel extremely isolated. And then literally one, they told you to go... I spent a year in and out of hospital with a very swollen arm. Um, all the discs in my neck collapsed. And I was told, you get yourself fit, Corporal Weaving. When you're ready, come back to work. I, I, I busted my balls to get myself to a, a spot where I could at least be good at something. Mm -hmm. And then I got the phone call, no, you're gone. Goodbye. Mm. The Sun newspaper um, have started a campaign mm -hmm. to make sure that... Boris has uh, now got a Minister for Veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think things are going to improve? Well... You know, as a CEO of a charity, I have to take a very uh, close line on being political, but I've got an opinion and that's what I'm here for. I'm actually extremely impressed with Boris Johnson. He's brought in Johnny's, Johnny Mercer as our uh, veteran minister. Mm. He's brought in Anne-Marie Trevlin as our um, defence minister. And those two people, and, and also the Minister of Defence, are extremely passionate about our forces. And at least he's at least he's done what everyone else has been thinking but hasn't done up to now. So respect to Boris Johnson. Uh, I don't know much about his other politics and I won't get involved in that, but as our community are mm -hmm. concerned, I thank you, sir. Thank you for what you've done for us. And let's hope you keep to what you say. The Northern Ireland campaign, the, being hounded for war crimes... Our community is getting smashed to pieces. If we're not topping ourselves, we're getting dragged into court over historic claims that are not far off nonsense, you know? We're at the worst stage that we've been in years. And we need these large charities that are sitting on a hell of a lot of money to start wheedling it down to people like us. I was forced to pay nearly £20,000 of my own pocket to get the retreat up and running mm. because um, some of the large charities weren't interested. It's a bit like if it's not their idea, mm. it's not a good idea. Mm. But in this current climate, um, I think we need to look at all um, options. It seems to me, just chatting to you over this hour, Gary, that you still need some help yourself as well. Yes. Are you getting it? Um, yes, I am. But what has saved my life is selfless commitment to others. Every time someone says thank you to me or my team for their son, daughter, father, wife, a little bit of me becomes back alive again. And the drugs and the drink and the self-medicating doesn't get a touch mm -hmm. on what it feels like to have self-respect again. And that's what I'm about. And if you'd seen me three years ago, you wouldn't have even recognised me. I was so ill, I could barely say my name. So I'm just trying to show the, the, the veterans, if I can do it, if I can come back from that 
extremely large, ticking, sweating, extremely ill man to be a CEO of and have 45 volunteers and a national charity, then so can you. All right. How can people get in touch with your charity, Gary? Uh, they can look us up on Facebook, um, Forgotten Veterans UK. Uh, they can look us up on Twitter. Our website is ForgottenVeteransUK.com. We're looking for 2,000 people to give us a pound a month so I can pay the rent on, at the fort and we can continue to keep helping hundreds of veterans. Gary, I hope things get easier for you. I know it's difficult. Thank and you. very, very, and I think this country has long uh, let our veterans down. We need our, you know, our forces have been depleted. Hopefully now they'll be built up again. And if it wasn't for people like you, Gary, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. We wouldn't be able to do all sorts of things that we are doing now. Thank you, James. I appreciate so it. So I'm sure everybody would join with me in thanking you for what you've done and everybody like you. And and you must, you know, you have to get yourself better. You have to get your head better. And with that, you need help. And I'm sure you're getting it. Yeah. And uh, I, I hope people will uh, Google, go on their search engines, find out more about forgotten veterans. And let's hope, well, let's hope in the future that veterans won't be forgotten. 